done voter registration in the field, out registering voters on street corners. So it's, it's both awesome work and miserable, right? <laughs> uh, so like, it's the most effective thing we can be doing to change the, the like uh, to change the structure, the fabric of our democracy in a positive way. But it's also miserable. Like, it is slow, arduous, backbreaking, and in the best case scenario, you're registering if you have tremendous capacity. 20 or 30,000 voters in an election cycle. That's a bunch of people, but it's chipping away at the margins. And we've got, in every state, 100 to hundreds to millions, hundreds of thousands to millions of people who are eligible and unregistered to vote. So in 2009, I started thinking about how we can have more structural, systematic ways of bringing tremendous numbers of people into democracy. Charted out a little bit of a plan. Uh, so started to pass online voter registration. As is particularly low hanging fruit in, in Oregon and in most places, we now have it in the majority of, I don't know, majority of states, I'm not sure, majority of people living in the country, certainly. So there are 28 states, um, I think 29, it seems like Kentucky passed an administrative rule that will allow for it that has to be approved by the legislature, but 28 states right. that have online registration. Right. In, in Oregon, we were shooting to be the fifth, uh, and, but it was relatively low hanging fruit. And, uh, but it also set up the infrastructure for automatic voter registration, and I'll say more about that in just a second. Uh, started talking about improving compliance on the National Voter Registration Act, which helps people think about interactions with the DMV as it relates to voter registration, especially helping legislators think about that. And then uh, sort of worked with our Secretary of, then Secretary of State, Kate Brown, who became a tremendous champion both of online voter registration and automatic voter registration. In 2013, uh, helped build a coalition, which we'll talk about in just a second, to move uh, automatic voter registration forward and eventually got it in 2015. Um, the case that we made, the messaging that we had for it, broke down in a couple of ways. Uh, first is that voter registration is an artificial impediment to democracy. It's not, it's not a thing most places do. It was invented in uh, the sort of mid-19th century by urban machines to keep uh, low-income and immigrant communities from voting. Uh, it was introduced in southern states about the same time as the poll tax. It's not a thing that we need. And there used to be kind of a case you needed a record of voters that you would keep in filing cabinets. But now if you register to vote, somebody takes that form, data enters it, puts it in the cloud, and that's it, right? So it's an artificial impediment that doesn't need to be there. That's the sort of first case. Second case is the tech is already pretty good. It's a no-brainer. Somebody interacts with the DMV. They interact with a number of other state agencies. They're giving the state every single piece of information they need to register them to vote. So if you don't pass automatic voter registration, or as we call it in Oregon, new motor voter, you are, you're basically saying, well, yeah, we could do it, but we'd rather make it harder for people to vote. <laughs> and people definitely thought that. They said it out loud. Uh, but it's, uh, it's part of our messaging. Uh, another piece of it is it's cheaper than paper. And electronic registration is about 10% the cost of a paper form. Most of this is data entry, but a lot of it is like just printing costs. Costs money. Uh, then the, the last piece is it's more secure in a variety of ways. So one, if say you're con if you're concerned about voter fraud, which we know in this room is not actually a thing that happens in the, this country, uh, if you are concerned, this is the most possibly secure method, way better than voter ID, which in fact disenfranchises people. This is folks who are proving their citizenship, in proving their eligibility in a government agency, uh, autumn, like, and that is the most secure system you can have. It also reduces data entry errors dramatically. So you have an access argument, you have a cost argument, you have a security argument, which makes a fairly compelling case. That doesn't mean people who don't like voting still didn't oppose it. They sure did. Um, but it at least makes a stronger compelling case in the media and to uh, sort of swing legislators. So built a coalition of, of messengers who could talk about the need from their community perspective and from a good government perspective. So the folks who were at the front of the line really leading the messaging were good government groups like the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, our organization in Oregon, the Oregon Bus Project, uh, also community groups, folks who are gonna, whose communities are going to be especially served by New Motor Voter. So that's uh, groups representing low-income communities, that's group representing communities of color, that's group representing uh, students, and then also sort of more traditional uh, social justice allies like Organized Labor, uh, our statewide LGBT organization, uh, folks who had close relationships with the Democratic majority in Oregon. Uh, we moved it in 2013. This is a relatively important part of this. Oh, one last thing I forgot about. Also, <laughs> national allies. Uh, 
So Branson and we worked really closely with in doing, some, in doing policy development work, in answering legal questions which inevitably come up, in doing materials prep. But a thing that Brennan knew to do, which we are so grateful for, is know to kind of stay out of the way publicly. A lot of times national groups will rush and be like, no, 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 that's ours. We love this. We're from Washington, D.C. and we think this is great. <laughs> Turns out not super helpful for state legislators. Uh, so we were blessed to have national organizations understand the utility of allowing it to be a state-based, understood as a state-based, a locally grown reform, but also being really helpful. So we're super grateful for that. Uh, in 2013, moved it through, got it passed bipartisan through the state house, died uh, in the Senate by a, uh, a split 15 to 15 vote, got 30 senators. And that was actually incredibly helpful. So we had all this momentum in 2013, uh, had built a tremendous case in the media, had built a tremendous case in the legislature, had people really excited about it, and then had it die a really painful death on the floor. Now, I would have rather gotten it in 2013, but after we picked up some seats in 2014, Oregon is magic, we do cool stuff there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was just really good. Uh, the, it was one of the first bills passed through the Oregon legislature. Because uh, folks had gotten committed to the idea of it. And I think it was one of the first two or three bills passed. And ironically, uh, you can Google Oregon governor scandal and uh, <laughs> find out the Kate Brown, who was our, uh, our Secretary of State for, for a number of years and was the, the chief elected champion of New Motor Voter, uh, got to be the first bill that she signed into law after our old governor resigned. Uh, so there was a real sort of great poetry to it, too. And it was just super fun to see our young organizers standing behind her as it was making national news circulating around MSNBC and CNN, seeing our young folks smiling faces behind as she signed the nation's first automatic voter registration bill into law. There's a bunch of other stuff we can do to make it better. We have to. Uh, but I'm happy to talk more about that in a little bit. Thanks so much, Henry. And I, I would agree, you know, we, 